Welcome to the North American Hunting Odyssey, where members experience and share the odyssey we call the hunt. This program has been created specifically for members of the North American Hunting Club. Hello everyone, I'm Bill Miller, editor of North American Hunter Magazine, your official club publication. And today I'll also be acting as your personal hunting guide for this exciting, fact-filled, special edition member showcase video. In gathering the necessary information to put this one-of-a-kind presentation together, we're fortunate that we didn't have to go very far. We went to the experts who are found in every single issue of North American Hunter Magazine. The members of our own Shooting Advisory Council, including Nick Sisley, Larry Weishan, Dr. John Woods, and Don Zutz, as well as North American Hunter columnist Hal Swiggett and senior editor Greg Gitcho. And so in the next hour, we'll be answering some of your fellow NAHC members' most asked hunting questions, as well as venturing into the fields and forests of North and South America, looking to share with each and every one of you the celebration of the hunt. And with that brief introduction out of the way, let's get them loaded up and get this special edition member showcase video underway. We work to answer questions from the club's three quarter million members from across the country. One of the most frequently asked questions is, what is the single most effective cartridge for North American big game? You'd be surprised how controversial that simple question is. Everybody has their favorites from the mighty mites like the 250 Savage up to the big bore magnums like the 338 and 375 Winchester. The best answer is, whichever you can shoot well and in which you have the greatest confidence. But when pressed to pick a specific cartridge, the North American Hunting Club Shooting Advisory Council, to the man, will recommend the time-honored 30 6 as the best cartridge for the one-gun hunter of North American big game. Today, the 30 odd 6 is available in the widest array of loadings and the broadest spectrum of firearm designs of any cartridge. The hunter or shooter looking to buy a 30 odd 6 today will find the cartridge available in single shot, pump, semi-auto, lever action, and bolt action rifles from many manufacturers. In fact, more manufacturers make 30 odd 6 bolt actions than any other caliber combination. For the hand loader, the possibilities with the 30 odd 6 are even greater. So if you're looking for one cartridge to do it all in North America, here's my advice. Get yourself a bolt action 30-06 of your favorite brand. Scope it with the highest quality optics you can afford. Sight the rifle in two inches high at 100 yards. Then, no matter what game you're after, whether it's antelope, black bear, white-tailed deer, mule deer, mountain goat, elk, wild sheep, or even moose, you'll be able to handle them all any day you go hunting. And NAHC member Mike Patillo of Columbus, Georgia will back me up on that one. He recently packed up the old reliable Ot 6 and headed off to South Texas to the King Ranch looking for a trophy whitetail. I've hunted in South Texas a number of times over the years, and one of the hardest things for the first time Texas whitetail hunter is to overcome the urge to shoot the first big buck he or she sees. Because let me tell you, you'll see all sorts of huge whitetails here in Texas yeah, every big, single day, especially on ranches like the King, the and Encinitas, what, and the Perlins, just to name a few. Okay. You'd be dead back home, boy. Nice, what is that, an eight or a ten? One, ten. That's probably the smallest. Smallest one we've seen with a nice right. Nine, nine point. He's following that dog with his ears back. He's mad at him. <whistles> Look at him running. Here we go. Go get him, boy. 20 yards running. Yeah, he was. His times aren't as tall as that first one, but he's a lot wider than that first one. Figure 14 inch. Here to see it. There it is. Look at this. They want to run. Scraping that ground. See it on his hocks right there. Mm. 
Nice day. Nice one. You know what I'm saying? A lot of deer. We're not, I can throw a rock and hit that deer. I'm about 15 feet from him. Oh, wow, look. Okay, he don't care about us. Time's got a little width to him too. He's ain't got a lot of mass. He's gonna make a scrape. Yeah. There he goes. As luck would have it, Mike couldn't get a clear shot off at that buck on the eve of his departure day. But First Light found him and his guide back in the same area where they'd last seen that big bruiser. And guess what happened next? Third day charm. I'm starting to get a little nervous. Showing about 6.45 across the road right in front of us. We stalked him for about 15, 20 minutes trying to get a shot. He's a good looking deer. That kicker definitely gives a little character in there. Where'd you hit him at, Mike? Not the greatest shot, but it put him down. We won't talk about the first shot where I forgot to put a round in the chamber when it was so early. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Argentina. What you're looking in front of you is the Andes Mountains. We're about uh, anywhere from 8 to 30 miles from the Chilean border. This country looks a lot like Nevada in spots. They raise a lot of sheep here and a lot of geese. That's the voice of NAHC member Les Colfit of Sparks, Nevada that you just heard describing a hunting trip he and his buddies took a couple years back to what some consider the waterfall and mecca of the Western Hemisphere, Argentina. It took Les and his friends three days to get to this waterfall wonderland, but as Les tells you, it was well worth it. That's fine. You know, it's absolutely killing me to watch this great hunting footage because I've wanted to go to Argentina myself ever since I heard about the incredible number of birds and species available in South America. And best of all, it doesn't interfere with our seasons here in North America. The best hunting south of the equator is in May and June. Boy, would that make for a nice summer vacation, wouldn't it? Nice shot. Waterfall hunting is unquestionably my favorite of all, but to be successful at it under all types of hunting conditions calls for some special equipment. If your idea of the world's greatest hunting is shotgunning big birds like light geese in Texas, Canada geese in the Dakotas, turkeys in the timber, or even big ducks like canvasbacks and mallards over decoys, then you should consider adding a 10 gauge to your hunting firearms collection. Over the last few years, this Remington SP-10 has become one of my favorite guns for waterfowl hunting. The 10 gauge offers numerous advantages, especially for hunting where steel shot is required. The experts recommend moving up two shot sizes when switching from lead to steel. That's fine, except it reduces the number of potential pellet strikes if you stick with your 12 gauge. Because of the increased demand brought about by the total conversion to steel shot for waterfowling, a number of manufacturers are offering 10 gauges in double barrels, pumps, and semi-auto models. Doubles have to use weight to compensate for the recoil, so they can become burdensome. Pumps are the most reliable, but semi-autos are best at reducing the healthy recoil of heavy loads. You can learn to tolerate the extra recoil by shooting your 10 gauge often and preparing for the season. This includes patterning to find out the most efficient load in your gun, and yes, even shooting some clay targets with the load you choose because you'll be more effective in the field if you do. Good quality gear contributes to the enjoyment of any hunt. Every hunter can cite the importance of good boots, a well-sighted rifle, and the right clothing. But there's one more piece of gear on which I rely for success as much as any of these, 
a good set of binoculars. And the reason I pick up my binoculars every time I pick up my rifle is simple. You can't shoot what you can't see. The first rule of firearm safety is to never point your gun at something unless you intend to shoot. The proper and safe way to identify your target is with binoculars. I carry binoculars on every hunt. I use them to identify game, judge trophy size, and to make sure of the target, and to double check waterfall species at a distance. Selecting binoculars can be confusing. There are sizes from minis to giants, magnifications from 7 to 20 power, and different internal optical designs. To make the best choice for yourself, consider the hunting situation you face the most. If you do a lot of hiking and climbing, lightweight and compact size are important. If you hunt mostly from a stand, size won't matter, but comfortable viewing and light gathering capabilities will. Magnifications for hunting binoculars should be either 8 or 10 power with high quality chemical coatings on the lenses. These coatings enhance the passage of light through the glass. That means more light reaches your eyes for the best possible view of game even in the shadows. More than anything else, the hunter needs to be concerned with the quality of these coatings. They make the difference in low light conditions where and when hunting is often the best. Buy the best hunting optics you can possibly afford. A serious hunter won't skimp on his rifle, his clothing, or his boots. And you shouldn't skimp on your binoculars either. And even though I didn't mention the need for good optics when hunting for wild turkey specifically, I consider them to be an absolute must-have when chasing these crafty birds. They can allow you to differentiate between hens and toms at a distance, and allow you to check beard length as well. But in this up-close and personal bow hunt with NAHC member Will Primos of Primos Game Calls, he would have settled for a shotgun instead. Let's join Will on his Badger State bow hunt, and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> hey, do you have bad breath or something? You had bad breath. <laughs> you smelled your breath. <laughs> that was cameraman Ron Jolly giving Will the business about his bad breath. And while it looks like he's ready to bite Ron's head off for making that clip, it's just that Will takes his turkey hunting so seriously that he's actually kicking himself for not taking a shot while he had the chance. I believe his reaction right here about sums up the morning's hunt. Coming up next is the second half of our optics question, which will ensure that your expensive hunting optics will always be in tip-top condition. Because being a good hunter means being able to handle anything Mother Nature can throw at us or our equipment. In all types of big game hunting, I consider high quality precision optics like rifle scopes, binoculars, and spotting scopes to be among my most important gear. They deserve cleaning and maintenance as detailed as any firearm, maybe even more so. The whole reason today's optics perform so well are the fine coatings on the lenses. It's this delicate chemical layer which allows optical instruments to enhance visibility in low light conditions, the times of day when hunting is the best. When cleaning a lens, it is essential to protect these coatings from scratches. So the first step is to remove the large particles of dust and dirt with either a spurt of compressed air 
or the gentle sweep of a soft bristled brush. With the visible dirt removed, place a drop or two of lens cleaning fluid on the lens and massage it with a clean swab to cover the entire surface. Then use a small piece of lens paper to absorb the moisture. You can buy custom lens care kits or easily assemble one of your own to take in the field with you. It weighs next to nothing and takes almost no space in your pack. The final step is to put your lens caps back in place and leave them on until you want to look through your binoculars or are preparing to shoot. One final hint is to never wipe your lens with a paper towel or tissue. Instead, to remove debris quickly, wipe the lens with a soft handkerchief or other soft cloth. Take care of your hunting optics and they'll be performing at peak efficiency long after you are. Coming up next is a prime example of why you need to keep your gear in tip-top shape so you can handle Mother Nature's worst. You're looking at one happy archer right there, not only for bagging that terrific whitetail, but because he was in that frozen tree stand for less than half an hour. With the wind chill of minus 30, sunshine came out, we came out, got in the stand, and we're there eight minutes when I killed this beautiful North Dakota nine point. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Jeff. Another often asked question of the North American Hunting Club Shooting Advisory Council is about the practicality of a double barrel shotgun. Here's the advisory council's unanimous response. You know, some things just seem to go together, like peanut butter and jelly, kids and puppies, and upland bird hunting and over-under shotguns. Like most hunters who enjoy pursuing upland birds like pheasant, quail, and grouse, I'll take any opportunity I can get to spend some time in the field behind my bird dogs. But given my druthers, I'll have an over-under shotgun over my shoulder when I do. Without a doubt, the old OU is the king of upland guns. Double barrels stacked on top of one another offer a variety of advantages over side-by-sides and other single-barreled actions. Number one and most important of those is safety. With the action broken open and the shotgun on my arm or slung over my shoulder, you can instantly recognize that the gun is in a non-firing condition, whether there are shells sitting in the chambers or not. This in particular is one reason why over-unders are so much preferred by trap, skeet, and sporting clays shotgunners. Additionally, it's very simple to inspect the barrels for an obstruction safely from the chamber end. The single barrel design tends to enhance accuracy over side-by-side -side guns by creating a more linear, focused sight picture for the shooter. Should you decide to try an over-under for your upland bird hunting, here's a couple of tips. Set the barrel selector for the bottom barrel first. Because of its lower position in relation to your body and hands, the firing of the bottom barrel creates straight line recoil and less muzzle jump, making your follow-up shot with the top barrel quicker and more accurate. This setup will allow you to take full advantage of a shotgun you will soon be calling your favorite, too. Come on in here, pal. Come on in. Here we go. Right here. 
Hey, 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 hold it, hold it here. Okay, Got another one. spot in mind for us, Harlan? Uh, yeah, just down the road. We had uh, four cubbies in here, so I think we pretty well worked it over. Just need to go down a little bit, a quarter mile, and do it again. Okay. I'd be hard pressed to think of a time when I wouldn't prefer to be shouldering my over under rather than a pump or auto loader for upland birds. And that definitely holds true on little buzz bombs called Bob White Quail. North American Hunting Club member Rick Hodges operates Southwest Safaris on the 74 Ranch. Rick, we've been looking around a little bit and it looks like we've got some great hunting opportunities here. Yeah, we do. Um, we're on about 27,000 acres of, of brush land here south of San Antonio and we run hunts for deer and quail, spring turkey, wild hog and, uh, and dove. Do you have management programs for all of them? Yeah, we try to. Um, we stress the management for quail. Uh, we do a lot of different things. We roller chop, disc, burn, um, opening up country where we can run dogs. Uh, that also benefits the other wildlife. What can we expect in size of coveys? Generally, uh, an average covey is going to be anywhere from 12 to 15 birds. Some are larger. Um, part of our plan here is we only take two to three out of each covey. We feel like that helps ensure their survival. Uh, it uh, kind of uh, it's a good group size for them to uh, avoid predators and, and make it through the winter. One thing we should stress for everybody too is that these are all wild birds. That's correct. We don't supplement the. Uh, we kind of get what Mother Nature gives us. And they sure add a new challenge to wing shooting. And they're plenty wild. They're uh, a little faster than most people are used to. Yeah. Went down up here. There it is. Hey, that was a great shot, Bill. Oh, thanks. You know, it's not tough to make a good shot though when you got the right shotgun. That's true. You know. Uh... At Remington, we spent four years developing the Peerless shotgun. We wanted to uh, we wanted to manufacture a, a sporting piece that was uh, lightweight, quick handling, um, good value for the for the uh, money, and uh, representative of traditional Remington quality. I think you got it here, and I know the lightweight's really coming into play on this hunt. We're doing a lot of walking behind these dogs, and uh, sure less fatigued at the end of the day. I noticed that myself. It was a very comfortable gun, and uh, and the weight, I think we, we hit right on the money. And it swings well, too. We get in some of this tight cover, and you can really get on those birds quick, and you need to sometimes. Combining it with these uh, premier 7.5 field loads that copper-coated works great out there when they get out a little further in the open country, too. Particularly with these wild sporty birds. <laughs> you betcha. They're getting up out there. Well, Holland's got the dogs working again up there. Let's go see what he's got. Let's go. Look at those feathers. I've never seen a dog light work like that in my life. Is that incredible? Isn't that neat? <laughs> you know, they're saying this is just an average year down here, but I don't know where else you can find 20 cubbies of wild birds in a day. I don't either, Bill. Not only uh, 20 cubbies, but 20 absolutely wild and sporting cubbies. <laughs> oh, the shooting something else. For anybody that's used to shooting birds on preserves, this is a whole different ball game. It was terrific. The, the uh, country and the ranch was beautiful. The dog work was spectacular, particularly uh, that uh, whole seeming, seeming super dog Ripley. Yeah, it was just remarkable to yeah. see that that performance. Well, I'll tell you, Texas has got the best of it all as far as I'm concerned. In the 
1920s, the Hearst family imported a number of exotic game animals and released them on their ranch in southern Monterey County. Among these species were the Audad sheep, a native of the Barbary Coast of Africa. Having ranged wild and free for the past 70 years, these sheep offer a unique challenge to the sportsman. For those frustrated sheep hunters out there who just can't seem to draw a tag, a hunt for one of these magnificent rams might just be the ticket. My only experience with Audad sheep has been on some ranches in Texas where these exotic imports are raised for hunting. But not these Audads, says NAHC member and outfitter Mike Schweibert of California. They're wild animals in every sense of the word and will test the skills of even the most hardened hunter. Just going over to the left, the furthest ram, the third from the left. one I ever got here, it took me two years to get, is that right? Here, that's spooky. And they just, you'd see them, they'd see a vehicle, like down there where we parked at, they'd be over near the ranch. They would be back on the they'd just go back. Mike and Robert finally located this small bunch of rams and spotted a real trophy in their ranks. The only way to intercept them for a clean shot, however, was to climb straight up the mountain behind them. So that's where we join our two intrepid Audad hunters. All right, take him when you're ready. All right. You got it. You got. He's down. He's down. I know it looks like Robert missed that big ram. But play the tape back again, and you'll see what really happens. Good job. All right. <laughs> Let's go take a look. I'm here with my father-in-law, Robert, Robert Costa our good friend Don Anderson. Uh, Don called me up the other day and said we've got a chance at some California Coastal Audad. So uh, like a good son-in-law, I called old <laughs> dad-in-law here and uh, we came out and Don was right and uh, got us in position at about 300 yards and Bob using his McGillivray custom rifle in 308 made a beautiful shot right behind the shoulder. One shot killed it over 300 yards. That sure is a nice trophy there taken by NAHC member Robert Costa. It measured 28 inches and placed well into the Safari Club International Record Book. And while not every hunt results in a trophy class big game animal being taken, that doesn't lessen the need to shoot a big bore rifle for some species. Bear, elk, moose, even wild hogs. 
These are North America's toughest big game animals. Taking them cleanly requires a well-placed shot from a rifle that packs a punch. For 90% or more of the big game hunting in North America, a cartridge like the old reliable 30 odd 6 is all you're ever going to need. But for those times you're after big, tenacious species, some of which may try to hurt you if you don't do your part right, you may want to consider moving up to a magnum caliber like the 338 Winchester or 300 Weatherby. They're big guns for big game. Unfortunately, magnum calibers have a reputation for kicking too hard. But there are ways to control the kick and get the most from these big guns. The best way to handle heavy recoil is to practice, practice, and then practice some more. You'll become more familiar with the gun, build up recoil tolerance, and gain confidence. Be sure your gun is fitted with a recoil pad and consider buying a model with a recoil suppressor, often known as a muzzle brake, on the end of the barrel. These devices change the direction of the gases leaving the barrel and substantially reduce the amount of recoil the shooter feels. Muzzle brakes can also be installed aftermarket on your favorite rifle. One word of advice though, always wear heavy duty hearing protection when shooting a gun equipped with a muzzle brake. That goes even when hunting with one. The vents do kick a lot of muzzle blasts back toward the shooter. Whether heading out for the hunt of a lifetime or choosing a rifle to shoot all the time, you can handle the recoil. It's just a matter of shooting the right gear and practicing with it. The white-tailed deer is truly an amazing animal. Despite growing human populations and urban sprawl, there are more white-tailed deer in North America today than at any time in history. And where white-tails and man try to live in the same neighborhood, there are often problems. Because white-tails today take up residence so close to large human populations, special seasons and gear are called for to make sure that hunts are successful and safe. This is why many deer seasons in heavy population areas are restricted to shotguns firing slugs instead of center fire rifles. But with the latest technology and shotgun slug rigs, no hunter needs to feel disadvantaged. In an interview when we were hunting together last season, Remington's Art Wheaton and Simmons' Larry Bridgman explained that it's all in the spin. Now, Remington offers a couple of options in the barrels that you can get for slug shooting. You can either get a full rifle barrel or a choke tube that's rifled. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, actually, three options. Of course, obviously, the smooth bore that everybody's familiar with. And then a choke tube option, whereby you can put a rifle tube in the end or just a plain improved cylinder, modified or full choke. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the fully rifle tube that you see here today. And, of course, you've seen us use the copper solid, and you know full well what capabilities of that mm -hmm. is in the fully rifled tube. And it's an imperative that that's used with a rifling system. But I've heard that you do get incredible accuracy from them with the rifled choke tube, even. Uh, you're correct. That does give it the uh, stabilizing twist in the last few inches of barrel. So for the guy that doesn't want to go out and really set up a rig just for deer hunting, that's a, a great Tremendous option. Tremendous versatility, absolutely. I mean, the guy literally can... Uh, bring his uh, barrel and shoot birds with it, or turn over to a, a deer hunting uh, combination come fall. Today, virtually every major manufacturer of shotguns is producing a specialty slug rig for deer hunting. So you'll have no problem finding one that suits your needs. Hunting with a slug gun is really a close range game. It's very much akin to hunting with a muzzle loader, or somewhat even with a bow. And what's neat about that is that gets you in close and personal to the deer. It becomes an added challenge of getting a deer inside that magical 100-yard mark. And when everything goes right and you do, it's really a feeling of accomplishment. The upper Midwest produces some mighty big bucks every year, but there's only parts of each state that are really known for the trophy deer. In Minnesota, this is it. You get down along the Mississippi River within 20 miles of those bluffs, and that's where the biggest deer in the state are. As far as eating, these deer are some of the best you'll find anywhere. They're corn and acorn fed, and that combination makes a young deer in particular an excellent piece of table fare. The early buck season is the best time to give you your best odds of taking a real trophy deer. But the doe season's important too because they do need to manage the numbers. We've seen a lot more does than bucks on this trip, and that gets out of whack when you hunt bucks only. That doe season helps bring things back in line to create a healthy herd. Though I didn't grow up deer hunting in this part of the state, uh, there's something special about the opening day of deer season no matter where you are. 
It's a very personal thing, yet it's great to invite some out-of-towners like Art and Larry and enjoy it with them, uh, to share my traditions and experiences with them, and through their stories, they get to share theirs with me. One of the great things about Minnesota, and what makes this an every man's deer hunt, is the fact that licenses for non-resident hunters are over the counter. You don't have to go through a draw or anything like that. You can come in, in fact, the day before the season and still buy a license. And that makes it accessible to everybody. You know, a big game hunt where you take off for one of the far corners of the country can run you a lot of money, thousands of dollars. But that's not true of a down-home deer hunt. If you've got a shotgun, you can just get the right barrel and the right ammunition, and you've got the firearm you need. And then you don't have to travel. You can probably hunt right from home. Down-home deer hunting generally takes place on private land. And that's a great tradition and one that we hope will continue for a long, long time. If we want that tradition to continue, it's every hunter's responsibility to get permission well ahead of the season and then respect the landowner's rights when you're on his property as his guest. What you're watching now is NAHC member Ross Hunt's first ever archery elk hunt in Arizona. Here comes the elk. You've got to watch this. Don't do nothing to him. Come off this block. He goes to the air and off that elk. Bigger, what was that, four point? Mr. Rag, four point. Oh, four point. And, yeah, but he, I seen him take off and go through there. I'll just give it a while. But I wasn't a bit shook up. I, was, I didn't feel any buck fever or anything. I just sat there and was concentrating on this back pin. A 20 yard pin, a 10 yard pin was on top of his back. 20 and 30 was right here. I knew I had him. A big first wapiti. After waiting for about an hour, Ross and his pals went to track the elk, and they found it less than 200 yards from where he shot it. 
Ross was the first to admit that it wasn't the biggest elk ever shot with a bow, but after waiting 10 years for the opportunity, he wasn't going to pass it up. But the best part of this elk hunt is told in a letter that accompanied the tape. It's from Ross's wife, Lori, and I think you'll get a kick out of it. Son, again, this is great. Now I can go home and have a baby with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> be kind of hard, I think. Well, I can watch my wife have a baby. We're going to name her Jessica Wapiti Hunt. <laughs> I was due on the first day of the hunt, due meaning I was to deliver our third child. Through a lot of persuasion, my husband left his hunt one day before with the promise he would shoot the biggest or dumbest animal he found. As you will tell from this video, it wasn't the biggest. He bagged his elk the second day out with a lifetime memory on this video for our new daughter. By the way, we did not name my little girl Jessica Wapiti Hunt, as I refused to have a child named Elk Hunt. Thank you for viewing this. I hope you enjoy it as much as we do. Lori Hunt. Do you remember Ross shooting from a kneeling position at that bull? North American Hunting Club senior editor Greg Gitchell explains why it's so important to practice from a variety of shooting positions. Boy, isn't it beautiful here in the shadows of the Absaroka Range out in western Wyoming. We just rode in about four hours from the trailhead. We're on an elk hunt, and hopefully we'll be able to show you some of that exciting footage a little bit later. But first, before we go out hunting, I want to make sure everything's still on target the way it was back in Minnesota when I was practicing. We've been on an airplane, I've taken the bow apart, now the sights are back on, the quiver's on, so I want to make sure it's shooting just the same way it was. I'm going to guess that target's a little bit over 20 yards, and that's something I've been practicing back home is the range estimation just by, just by eye. So I think that's a little bit over 20. See, that's exactly why we do this. That arrow hit a little bit high and a little bit left, but I'm not going to say that the bow's off just because of that. Might have been a bad shot on my part. Let's go get that arrow and try it again. I'm not going to move a thing yet. I'm going to take another shot. Let's see how this one looks. That's better. I knew it wasn't the bow's fault, but hey, I was standing up shooting that shot, and that's probably not going to happen out here elk hunting. I need to take some shots from a kneeling and sitting position, just like I was doing back home in my practice. I'm going to go get this arrow and do that. First off, I'm going to go into a kneeling position. And you know I've picked this position on purpose. I'm shooting between two trees. There's low grass that I have to shoot just over. It's a situation I'll probably face when I'm out elk hunting. There we go, that's a decent shot too. And I'm gonna try a sitting position because I might face that out in the field too. Okay, everything's looking good. But you know, there's one more thing that I do just after we get set up. And no matter what type of big game hunting I'm doing, I like to use this range finder to check distances to different objects around me. I like to see if a tree is 30 yards, 20 yards, because when you're bow hunting, it makes a big difference. This little device is really handy for doing that type of stuff. So I can tell that tree is just over 10 yards. If I come over here, look out at that rock, that's about 25 yards. It sure is good confidence to have a little device like this. They're relatively inexpensive. It's cheap insurance when you're out bow hunting because two or three yards can be the difference between a hit and a miss. Bullets, bullets, bullets. The number of choices available, even in a single caliber and cartridge, is mind-boggling but it can be honestly said there is a right bullet for every shooting situation. The tough part can be finding it. I'm lucky enough to shoot all year long and work in the hunting world every day. Yet even with diligent study, it can be difficult to keep up with all the latest innovations in bullet design. Fortunately, there are a few basic principles you can use to demystify hunting bullet selection. Bullets for hunting purposes fall into three main categories. There are bullets for varmints and small predators like woodchucks, prairie dogs, foxes, and coyotes. There are bullets for thin-skinned big game like deer and antelope. And there are bullets for large and sometimes dangerous big game like grizzly bear, moose, and elk. The best way to tell on factory ammunition is to carefully look at the information printed right on the end of the box. Here's a box of Remington extended range ammunition for a 280 Remington, one of my favorite all-around hunting cartridges. The key is to look closely at the bullet weight indication. 
The rule of thumb is that heavier bullets are for heavy game, lighter bullets for lighter game. Each has a specific performance goal it is designed to achieve. The best way to determine if your bullet matches your hunting situation is to study the cartridge box or the manufacturer's annual catalog. Make your selections, then test them in your rifle for accuracy. And one last tip. Don't let anyone claim that a heavy, slow, blunt-nosed bullet will bust brush. No bullet of any design will reliably perform on game after it hits anything between you and your target. We're here at Trailhead to an undisclosed location in the Salmon Mountains of the Eastern Trinity Alps Wilderness Area. It's a half million acre wilderness area in Northern California. A little view of the stuff we're heading up into. Those big racks, they like that stuff. It's going to be a tough, hard hunt. Put a bit of brush up in there, they favor that stuff. Isn't that some of the most beautiful country you've ever seen? No matter which direction you turn in this rugged wilderness, you're treated to one breathtaking view after another. You're in the Trinity Alps Wilderness Area of Northern California on a backpack trip for Colombian black-tailed deer with NAHC Life member and guide Mark Slack and his hunter John Agajanian. This is a half million acre tract of pristine wilderness with one way in and one way out, your own two feet. Black-tailed deer are relatively unknown to most hunters east of the Rockies as their range is limited to the Pacific Northwest. I had the pleasure to hunt for California subspecies of blacktail a few years ago, and as you can see, I was lucky enough to score on a pretty nice buck. Blacktail don't sport the kind of racks that whitetails grow, and so anything in the 15 to 16 inch range is a personal trophy. Uh, here we have John standing next to a pretty good sized ponderosa pine. They do get quite a bit bigger, twice the size, but what's of interest here, I'll show you, is this license plate. It's about 1933. That was placed up there by a snow survey crew. It uh, shows you the depth of the snow. Let me pull back here and you can see what this country can do in the winter. The Colombian black-tailed deer. They're starting to move. We're on our evening event. They're starting to move. And then there is the Sitka blacktail species found in Alaska and British Columbia. This is a Sitka taken by North American Hunter senior editor Greg Gitchell this past season. Greg's rightfully proud of his blacktail. But for now, getting back to Mark and John, as you can see, they've struck pay dirt. As John managed to put the crosshairs on his dandy Colombian blacktail. Down uh, at 8.30. So, excuse me, 7.30. Way to go, Johnny. Looks like we're going to have about a 15 inch inside spread. Beautiful, beautiful animal. Beautiful. That deer is two years old. You, look, you can tell by looking at the teeth. The wear on the teeth. Absolutely gorgeous black tail. Absolutely beautiful buck. Is he Got happy or the what? Stuff. A backpack hunt in the Salmon Mountains of the half million acre Trinity Alps wilderness area. As I probably told you dozens of times on these videotapes, the versatility of interchangeable choke tubes lets you make your shotgun anything you want it to be. One of the most wonderful things about modern firearm technology is the versatility of a single gun. The shotgun with choke tubes is a perfect example. A simple quick twist of the wrist allows you to use the same gun for upland bird hunting, waterfall hunting, turkey hunting, clay target shooting, and even deer hunting. It's long been a saying in target shooting circles, beware of the man who shoots one gun for everything. Today, with the versatility afforded by interchangeable choke tubes, that's even more true. Choke is the constriction of a shotgun barrel towards the muzzle end. It regulates the size of the pattern. The rule of thumb is that you use tighter chokes for shooting the longer range, larger targets use more open chokes at short range on smaller birds. Determining which chokes perform best for your particular hunting situations is a matter of getting out during the off season and doing some experimenting at the patterning board. Choke constrictions, shot sizes, loads, and different shot materials and coatings throw a whole lot of variables into the mix. The only way you will be able to determine which works best for you 
is to get out and do some shooting at the range with lots of combinations. Many firearms manufacturers are even offering rifle tubes for shotguns. These allow accurate shooting of the latest high-tech gear slugs out to 100 yards and beyond. Again, the place to learn the best combination for your situation is at the range well ahead of the hunting season. And to be a successful spring bear hunter calls for lots of preparation well ahead of opening day as well. An NAHC member, Richard Brick of Wisconsin, is ready to share some of that information with you, his fellow NAHC members. There's a few things you should remember. We'll be going into different states and into Canada to make this video. So all the techniques that we show you may not be legal at, in your area. So try to uh, check with your DNR before using any of these techniques. How I lo locate a bear if I, if I don't have anything else to go on, I'll take one of these topographical maps, I'll go on the northern edge of a swamp. Let's take, for example, well, this is a swampy area. i tell you, this is a pretty decent sized swamp. It's uh, well, three quarters of a mile across and it probably runs for a couple of miles here. The white area in here is a open marsh area with a creek running through it. You should be looking for that. A small creek, and maybe a feeder creek that runs into a lake, a big swampy area. I go on the northern edge of that. I, I set my baits right on the edge of the swamp, but once they found the bait, they're not going to forget about it. And the wind will always be in your favor. Obviously, you don't want something blowing into the woods. Into the woods, you're not going to see a bear. They've got a nose on them that's a hundred times better than ours. So that's where I would locate uh, that uh, your baits, and then you can hang your test baits out, which we'll get into in a little while, and. Uh, You'll know when a bear hits them by claw marks in the trees and, and such like that, depending on what you, how you, uh, what kind of bait you hang. This is how you can tell a bear hit your bait, your test bait. You can see that uh, what he does is he holds on with his back feet, his back uh, claws, and he digs in, and he just doesn't take him but a few seconds to get up there. But uh, this is what it looks like after he gets done with your test bait, taking it out of the tree. I think that's evidence enough that you've got a nice bear hitting it. What we've got here is a little propane tank and a one burner stove. I can't remember who makes it, probably Coleman makes the tank. But uh, what we're going to be telling you here is uh, it's a honey burn or a bacon burn. Either one works equally as well. I'll, uh, I just set it in there, pack it around with sand real good, get it so why I like to stick it in the hole is because if something knocked, if it was sitting up and they knocked it over, you might be able to start a fire. This way, you're right down in there, you're, you packed it with sand all on, it's nice and tight, they can't pull it up on you. Now what you do is you take a tin can, maybe, or oh, you can cut half of a um, coffee can off or, or whatever you want to do, just a tin can, just use your imagination. Fill it up about half full of uh, either grease drippings that you have, uh, bacon drippings that you have, or uh, honey. And you just start your one burner stove and you just let it simmer there. It'll boil and boil and boil. You can let the darn thing boil out till there's nothing left. That'll send such a pungent odor off that uh, if there's a bear around, believe me, you'll be in to investigate it.
opening day, 3.37 p.m. There he is, down and dead already. I don't know how much he weighs yet, but it's opening day. He's a black bear. He's a legal black bear. We'll weigh him after a while. Can you believe it? Our hour's already up. Seems like we just got started on this special member showcase video and it's already time to go. But before we say goodbye, there's some people I want to thank. First of all, the staff at the North American Hunting Club and the members of the NAHC Shooting Advisory Council. We relied a great deal on their expertise in putting this tape together. But most of all, I want to thank you, the members of the North American Hunting Club, because you're the ones that make this all possible. See you next time, and until then, good hunting.